Hello, my name is Jane Ellen Nichol. I'm an elder in the West Virginia Annual Conference, and I'm chaplain at Allegheny College, which is in Northwest Pennsylvania. My topic today is defining moments, resistance to changing social structures. This is a defining moment for the United Methodist Church, which has been brought to the breaking point over homosexuality, an issue that's dealt with peripherally in scripture. There are only a handful of passages and a few of them are unclear as to their meaning, and yet conservatives seem willing to fracture the church over them. It's clear to me that biblical arguments cover deeper resistance that the resistors themselves are unaware of. This resistance is expressed as fear. LGBTQ inclusion is seen as a threat, but a threat to what? I contend that both the ordination of LGBTQ persons and same-sex marriage are seen as a threat to institutions that define us as individuals and as a church. For some people, when defining institutions are under threat, so are the identities that we de derive from them. This is why heterosexuals feel threatened by same-sex marriage. As one woman said to me, my marriage doesn't mean the same thing if two men are permitted to marry. In seeking to understand this resistance, I turn to the work of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. He describes how humans create social structures which in turn shape us, reproducing the social relationships and the patterns of domination that we have embedded within those structures. Stated with Bourdieu's characteristic complexity, these are structured structures predisposed to function as structuring structures. In other words, we define them and then they in turn define us. Bourdieu's elegant complex theory goes beyond simple resistance to change and describes how these institutionalized power relations reproduce themselves through the socialization process that takes place primarily at home, at school, and at church. Socially constructed patterns become normalized and are reinforced throughout our social world. We see the same people in authority in all sectors of society. Leaders in business, government, entertainment, and the church have traditionally been white, presumably heterosexual men. We encounter more opposite sex couples than same sex couples. In religion, these structures are not just the norm, but they are perceived as God's intended order. Thus, arbitrary patterns are eternalized and we then find scriptures that validate them. The husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. This entire process is so internalized that we are unaware that it happens. For those who are comfortable within these structures, changing them feels like overturning the natural order of things. Furthermore, furthermore Bourdieu notes that such changes occur at times of social change when it already feels like the ground is shifting beneath us and everything we know is under threat. So that sounds good in theory, but why do I think that's what's going on here? Well, assuming that resistance to the leadership of African Americans and women was rooted in similar dynamics, I examined speeches of general conference delegates when the leadership of these three groups was being considered for evidence of expressed resistance to social change. In considering race, I looked at the Methodist Episcopal Church South and their conversations in the early 20th century uh, about reuniting with the MEC, having split in 1844. The MEC South argued stringently for a segregated structure, claiming that black Methodists could have no leadership over white Methodists as clergy or as general conference delegates because they were a backward race and not sufficiently developed for such responsibility. As one delegate said, there is no principle of sound philosophy and no revelation of religion that would compel an advanced race such as we represent to put themselves under the domination, under the fear of the domination, or even fear of the balance of power in the hands of a backward race 2,000 years behind ourselves in the achievement of civilization. This argument rests on a concept that was common at the time, sometimes called social evolution. As white Methodists came into more frequent contact with freed slaves and immigrants of different ethnicities, they placed these different cultures on a hierarchy as a way to justify highly restricted social spaces. The American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois described that idea in a 1931 article when he wrote, 
there is a question that persists in the minds of large numbers of white people today as to how far the earth is inhabited by nations and races essentially equal in their gifts and power of accomplishment, or how far the world is a hierarchy headed by the white people with other groups graduating down by grades of color to smaller and smaller brain power, ability, and character. The MECS delegates all took a paternalistic attitude toward black Methodists and insisted on two separate churches, one black and one white. The 1939 merger that created the Methodist church was actually a compromise. The South won segregation in the form of a central jurisdiction for black Methodists, but the Northern Church made sure that African Americans had a voice in church governance by granting them a place as general conference delegates. The leadership of women was contested for more than 75 years, from 1880 when Anna Oliver petitioned the MEC General Conference to ordain her, until the Methodist Church approved full clergy rights in 1956. In 1924, the General Conference allowed women local ordination to address the shortage of male clergy following World War I and the need for female missionaries to be able to baptize in countries where women could not be touched by men. But these women had no guaranteed appointment and no representation at any level of church governance. The argument against women's leadership was not based on their abilities, but on preserving the higher calling of marriage and motherhood. Industrialization and urbanization, again, social change, had created the, the middle-class family where dad goes to work and mom stays at home, and the MEC delegates resisted any change to that now familiar structure. One delegate lavished praise on women while arguing against their full clergy rights. He said, we want in our Methodism that our women shall have the widest possible opportunity to exercise all of those functions for which they are splendidly and or particularly and splendidly fitted by their splendid natures. But it has been pointed out to you in better language than I can employ that these sisters and wives and daughters of ours are by nature endowed with the noblest capability God has committed to human creatures, the capability of mothering the generations that are to be. And I say to you with all seriousness, while I want for the women in our church to have all the opportunities that can be granted to them in reason and in love, I am not ready to vote upon that today. The limitations, not the opportunities, but the limitations which an itinerant connection would put upon them. Another delegate imagined what fate would have befallen Methodism had Susanna Wesley gone into the ministry instead of giving birth to John and Charles Wesley. <laughs> I'm going to let that one go. <laughs> Approval of full clergy rights in 1956 was still strongly opposed. One delegate, after claiming that voting yes for this step would mean agreeing to accept a woman pastor and clergy agreeing to serve under a female district superintendent, concluded by saying, my last question that I believe the delegates of this conference would have to answer in the affirmative if they vote yes would be this, we are willing to elect a woman bishop. Now you may think that this is rather exaggerated, but believe me, it is not. You have had reference to the power of womanhood. I leave that to your own thinking. You will see this was, statement was made by a woman uh, who uh, expresses resistance, which reflects Bourdieu's contention that even those without power are socialized to advocate for familiar social structures. Arguments against gay marriage and ordination have been a bit of a moving target. The United Methodist Church addressed sexual orientation at its first general conference in 1972, again following a wave of social change in the form of civil rights, women's rights, more immigration, and everything else that happened in the 1960s. The 1972 Episcopal Address set a fearful tone for that general conference as bishops spoke about social uneasiness and the waning influence of the church. Delegates portrayed gay men especially as a danger to young men and boys. A delegate who was a physician maintained that homosexuality was a reversion to paganism. It is frowned upon by respectable society and condemned in the Bible. By many, it is looked upon as a disease. Homosexuals are notably promiscuous and a causative part of the alarming spread of venereal disease in this country. This prevailing sense of fear at the 1972 General Conference was part of uh, what led to the addition of the incompatibility clause to our social principles, which claims that homosexual practice is incompatible with Christian teaching. By the 1980s, the tone of the resistance had shifted and delegates distinguished between a person's sexual identity and same-sex sexual activity. 
We might call this the hate the sin, love the sinner posture. Delegates claimed that practicing homosexuals engaged in sinful behavior that disqualified them to serve as clergy. Said one, I think if there's any place we need to stay together as sisters and brothers, it is in regard to the moral standards for our ordained clergy. Friends, let us be precise. Let's say what we mean and mean what we say. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. We believe that the purity of our ministry, the unity of our system, and the integrity of our church depend upon it. This reference to the purity of ministry indicates the idea that gays and lesbians would somehow pollute the entire body of the ordained clergy. Over time, this handful of biblical passages that address homosexuality have been convincingly critiqued by several presenters at this conference. Conservatives then have countered with an argument that relies on heterosexuality as the created norm. We can call this the Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve argument. This approach also addresses the fact that Jesus said nothing about homosexuality, but did affirm heterosexual marriage, in which a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. As the scriptural argument has shifted, though, opposition to LGBT inclusion remains resolute, which reinforces the idea that the resistance itself is not rooted in scripture but that the passages are selected to justify deeper fears of which we are unaware. Concern about marriage then was prevalent at the 2019 General Conference that rejected the One Church Plan in favor of the traditional plan. Because the 2016 General Conference postponed legislation on LGBT inclusion, 2019 was the first General Conference to address the issue since the US Supreme Court upheld same-sex marriage in 2015. Several delegates expressed concern about the changing definition of marriage. One relied on Jesus' comments in Matthew 19 to make his case when he said, the words of Jesus are the words that we should follow and listen to and obey. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so when Jesus is asked about questions of marriage and sexuality, he gives to us a definition of marriage that says marriage is a union between a man and a woman. So the one church plan to redefine marriage is troublesome for me. I just have difficulty in presuming upon the authority of our Lord. LGBTQ persons are increasingly supported in the US. The Pew Center documents Methodist growing approval of gays and lesbians. A more recent survey indicates that two thirds of white mainline Protestants in the US approve of gay marriage, which would probably include many United Methodists. So as many of us know, the United Methodist policy is being swayed by increased percentage of delegates from overseas that represent a wide variety of cultural understandings on sexuality. One Russian delegate's remarks at this year's general conference reflect the idea that heterosexuality is the norm that God created and that procreation is marriage's primary function. In Genesis, it says that the purpose of God is that the marriage will proclaim and praise the Lord. So we need to praise God and multiply but one sex marriage will not multiply. It is a unit of one man and one woman. This is what marriage is. If you disagree with that, then you violate the law of our creator. This delegate went on to urge the church to keep its purity, again reflecting the idea that LGBTQ persons somehow taint the church through sinful behavior. So the impasse where the United Methodist Church finds itself is complex with many contributing factors. Among them are the different ways that we respond to social change. As social structures that define us continue to be transformed, some people experience that redefinition as liberation, namely LGBTQ persons and others who've been marginalized and excluded. For others, dominant groups and those who are comfortable in traditional structures, redefinition strikes deep fear and leaves them feeling like the world they know has become unglued. Our history of race and gender illustrates that such fear is not easily overcome. It's either accommodated as it was in the central jurisdiction or eventually enough resistors die off as was the case with women's leadership. The international nature of our church makes both of these solutions unlikely so I fear that formal schism may be inevitable. So thank you.